Welcome to Connections. Bringing together King's Business School's sharpest minds with first-hand insight from leaders in the world of business, public service, science and beyond. Hello and uh, welcome to this podcast on the topic of neurodiversity in the workplace recorded on the 6th of April 2022. I'm Dr Madeline Wyatt, I'm a reader in diversity and inclusion at King's Business School and a Leverhulme Research Fellow. Um, in my research I examine the impact of social mobility and the challenges experienced by women and people of colour in their journeys to leadership. I'm also the Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Lead at King's Business School. I'm delighted today to be speaking to Dan Harris. Dan is the CEO of Neurodiversity in Business, which is focused on supporting UK businesses to implement neuro-inclusive workplaces. Um, today we'll be discussing some of the challenges and opportunities for neurodiverse people in the workforce. Welcome, Dan. Thank you, Madeline. Really delighted to be here. And uh, it's a real honour to have an association with uh, King's Business School. Thank you. Um, and so starting with the basics, what do we mean by neurodiverse? So um, neurodiversity is a concept which was introduced by an amazing um, sociologist called Judy Swinger uh, a number of years ago. And, and essentially, in, in layman's terms, it just refers to cognitive diversity. So it just refers to the fact that Neurologically, all of our brains are different, as indeed our physical appearance is different, our skin colour, our lot, lots of other attributes of being human. So we, we use this term because it's a very inclusive term covering a number of different conditions. And the most well known would be um, autism spectrum condition, dyslexia, dysgraphia, ADHD and, and, and a number of others. But it's just designed to impress upon people that where we are different, those differences can be strengths uh, and you shouldn't just uh, consider those as, as challenges. So, yeah, it's, it's kind of a, a large umbrella, um, a lot of things to think about for, for organisations, I think. So what do you think are the key challenges that neurodiverse people typically face in organisations? I think that conceptually, neurodiversity is uh, many years behind the other um, aspects of our diversity and inclusion that we've made um, good or great strides on, depending on who you talk to. So where we've made some good progress on gender balance and ethnicity and sexuality and um, other areas, um, neurodiversity has been a concept that I think has sat in the too hard to deal with bucket for, for quite some time. In the corporate world, um, HR functions have found that actually there's such a breadth of different conditions within that uh, grouping of neurodiversity. But also, really important to note that it's, it's impossible to stereotype one person. So they say if you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. So within the individuals and across the whole group, there's so much variability that um, it's, um, it's hard sometimes to get your hands around that, that concept. So I've talked very conceptually there, Madeline, but also what I would say is that one of the earliest stage things that I've seen corporates do and, and do well is actually evangelise the idea that neurodiversity is something that is uh, supported, accepted, and the business is aware of. Um, where that hasn't worked well, you will find people going into work and not being able to self-disclose, not be able to explain um, how they work best. And, and that's really important to the businesses, I think, Madeline, because what corporates are, are increasingly waking up to is that handled correctly and with the right amount of focus, neurodiversity can be a competitive advantage. And what I mean by that is twofold. So there's the obvious piece around retention. So it's, it's pretty expensive to re-recruit talent and to uh, induct them into the business processes, and then to assimilate all of that organization knowledge. Uh, it's a lot more cost effective to businesses to make sure that they retain top quality talent, as, as you know best than most people. So there's the retention piece, but then also recruitment. We're, we're all very aware of the shocking statistics around the proportion of um, certain conditions in terms of the employment gap. So Whereas, you know, you, you may say kind of 79, 81% looks roughly like what the employment levels are across different countries. The employment gap for um, neurodivergent people is significant and, and it hasn't really measurably improved uh, over the last few decades. 
Well, that's really interesting because I think you touched on there about disclosure, and I think that's a really important point. There's obviously this issue around whether to disclose to your employer or not, and the threat that might be perceived around being kind of kind of discriminated against, othered, um, stigma associated with that. So what would you advise individuals to do in terms of disclosure? I know it must depend hugely on on the the types of neurodiversity, but what is there a kind of like a broad um, idea that you should follow? Yeah, I think the the key concept there, Madeline, it's a really, really great question. So thank you for asking it. Um, I think that the, the, the key aspect is, you know, do what you feel psychologically safe to do within your workplace. Um, I could sit here and catalyze people to be immediately self-disclosing, but that would be irresponsible because we don't really know the circumstances that they're doing that in. What I can say is two things. First of all, I feel that over the last five years in particular, we have become a lot more accepting of um, neurodiversity and, and diversity of thought. Um, so I do feel that we're, we're the new, new paradigm of diversity and inclusion. People are now stepping up and saying, I want to talk about this. I want to talk about my dyslexic uh, thinking, if that's the, um, the, the kind of the term in, in the press this week at the moment, or I want to talk about my strengths and, and how actually my ADHD um, enables me to do certain things differently. So the disclosure aspect is a very personal journey. And, and what I would suggest and, and where I've seen good, good experience is to find someone that you really trust in that workplace. Maybe there is an ally, maybe there are others that are self-disclosed and, and understand what's the organizational context. How did they disclose? Did they go officially to HR or did they go to a, a, um, a senior person in their leadership function? So kind of map out what that journey would look like. And then I think, Madeline, we have to flip the coin here as well. And we have to say, how do big businesses and, and, and medium size, how do businesses actually create an environment where it's accepted and encouraged? And, and I would say we've seen massive progress here. So Neurodiversity awareness is an order of magnitude higher than it was five years ago, for sure. People are talking about this topic. It's in the news. It's all over LinkedIn. You know, you, you'll see a lot of organizations talk about this. And that's absolutely key because we want people to come to work and bring their authentic self. That is something that actually by talking about this topic at the senior levels within businesses, um, people from across the organization can see actually, I feel like I would be accepted. I feel like I would have the right support in place. And also, um, it's such a massive weight off people's mind when they can come to work and they don't have to hide their own personality, hide their own strengths and, and ways of working, but actually can be really true and, and authentic. And I think that kind of speaks to, I guess, that movement away from the medical model of thinking about neurodiversity as a kind of deficit a problem that needs to be treated to making it more acceptable and, and seen as more of a social, it's just part of the social norm. And I can see that it's very much linked to the business case for diversity and saying what the, the benefits are. But do you think that ever comes with a cost? So do we pigeonhole people with neurodiverse profiles into certain roles? So I know organisations like MI5 or GCHQ are quite well known for kind of trying to recruit dyslexics, for example. So, you know, because they have fantastic coding abilities and things. I know that from my own experience of people that I've worked with who can spot minute differences in code that I could never see. But does that mean that they get kind of segregated or pushed into certain types of roles that aren't as rewarded as more mainstream positions? Yeah, I think this is a very hot topic in the ND community. And I would defer to the greater academic intellects than myself. So I'm only going to talk from a very narrow corporate perspective, but I would point you to a, a number of sources. So um, Sienna Castellon, who's an amazing young lady who leads uh, and has founded the Neurodiversity Celebration Week, has talked about this quite recently on LinkedIn. And I'd really recommend that, that your, your viewers and listeners give, give a follow. She talked about the fact that actually it's quite dangerous um, to focus too much on perceived superpowers and I, I put that in inverted commas because the experience is so unique to the person that it might be we're falling into another stereotypical hole here really of saying dyslexic people can do this and do it always well and, and indeed 
for example, autistic people can not do this or, or they, they suffer with the, these kind of challenges. So I think that um, coming, coming back to your question, it is one that society, but particularly the ND community, views as quite a contentious topic at the moment. So there isn't going to be a right answer to this. And, and neurodiversity, it has its roots in the social model of disability. Uh, and that, that model considers disability to be a civil rights issue. So, you know, Judy said it really well, neurodiversity at its heart is a social movement. So you, you'd, you'd always need to be cognizant of the fact that for an individual to enjoy the full range of human experiences, that perceived impairment, actually, as you alluded to earlier, that's a societal impairment rather than an individual one. Kind of pick up on this point around the superhero. I hear that this a lot. So this whole issue around suggesting that people with neurodiverse profiles are kind of have these genius abilities. And I think that's definitely true of some people, like you say, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it, it kind of covers everyone. And I know there's an issue around the kind of spiky profiles. So you might, you might be good at kind of numerical ability or less good at li- kind of literacy or something. And there's a mix depending on, on who you are. But I've definitely seen when talking to people about their experiences is that sometimes that superhero label can really make people feel like the challenges that they're experiencing aren't valid. So how would you, what would you kind of give your advice about how people can navigate neurotypical workplaces? So is there anything that organisations can do, not just to benefit from neurodiversity, but also just support when it's actually quite challenging? Yeah, absolutely. And 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 I think you've hit the nail on the head. It, it is something that a significant portion of the community do, do object to. So we, we should not look to minimise individuals' experiences and their day-to-day uh, life challenges insofar as elements of the, the, their kind of neurodivergency is considered by themselves to be disabling. But what, what we're trying to say here is that actually, and you, you explained it really well, we need to be thinking not solely about the white middle class male, you know, superhuman powers uh, on data analytics, for example, because that in itself is building out quite a dangerous narrative. Well, not not quite a very dangerous narrative, because there's such a spectrum on both on, for example, on the autistic spectrum, but also across neurodiversity, that we really need to think about who's not in the room. Yeah. So who hasn't had the, the privilege or the access or the ability to access a diagnosis from an early age, which then is a gatekeeper for potentially support in school and then maybe getting a sufficient education attainment to get a, a highly skilled job, for example. So we need to think about who's not in the room. Neurodiversity is a great example of this because there's such great intersectionality around ethnicity, race, sexuality and, and, and gender as well. Because, for example, unfortunately, in, in our um, kind of recent history around kind of medical diagnosis of um, autism spectrum condition, for example, you would tend to find that it's predominantly white males who are doing the diagnosing uh, of a certain age, and they would be disproportionately looking out for stereotypical behaviours of the little boy who likes to line up trains. But unfortunately, what we miss then is a significant number of young ladies who um, don't necessarily demonstrate those types of behaviours. But then later on, um, they come into the medical system for uh, borderline personality disorder, depression, anxiety. Whereas actually, if we had a more holistic understanding of what autism is, then you'd pick up those children earlier and be able to give them the right support. And then the final thing I'd say is that also very unfortunately, you would find in the UK that a, and this talks to the ethnicity and the, the race aspect, is that a young uh, black boy in inner city London or, or Birmingham or Manchester, wherever, would tend to be kind of unfairly labelled as naughty or disruptive, whereas a, a white middle class young girl in a more affluent area would possibly get access to an ADHD diagnosis a bit quicker. So we really need to break down those barriers and keep asking ourselves who's not in the room before we even necessarily think about that employment aspect later on. 
And that access to, I guess, a, a diagnosis or a, a kind of an assessment is quite important, isn't it? Especially when you talk about these intersections, about who has access to that or not. And I'm aware of this kind of growing attention also paid to um, self-identification. So people who not necessarily go through a formal assessment process, but I know that's also quite controversial. What do you think about that? I mean, do you feel like you have to be formally assessed to be considered neurodiverse or or can people self-identify? No, I, I strongly think that diagnosis isn't the uh, the, the precursor to, um, to neurodiversity. So we've already talked, you, you and I, about the fact that certain groups in our community are disadvantaged and marginalised in terms of being able to access that pathway. Um, and you'll tend to find it is disproportionately weighted to those who have access to resources um, or indeed are in the right part of the country. So absolutely, so diagnosis isn't a requirement. Um, but then I think you introduced another topic as well, which is around self-identification. And I think that's inextricably linked with the first point as well, because if you don't actually have the fair playing ground in order to get access to a diagnosis, there will be a significant portion of those people who self-diagnose who actually, with goodwill and good faith, are very, very correct in what they say and what they feel. So I don't think you can ever take away the experiences. And what I like to say is that rather than kind of ask people or put them into this, this kind of grouping of, of neurodiverse, we, we, we say, you know, do you associate with any of these neurodivergent conditions? You know, and, and that, I think, is a is a more inclusive way of, of considering the topic. So when we're thinking about organisations and, and what support they can offer, obviously a lot of that might link into the Equality Act about, you know, the kind of technical definitions of disability and, and neurodiversity. Does that mean that it becomes a little bit tricky when people self-ID? So does it mean that we can't, you know, truly identify who is or who isn't legally supported? Yeah, it does. It, it does make it a bit more tricky. But I think where organisations are moving to, I think, is, and, and this is the best practice, is the principles of, of universal design. And I'd really recommend your, your listeners um, have a look at Dr Nancy Doyle, who's, who's a fantastic academic on this topic, who, who a lot of your viewers will, will know. And actually on, on the Neurodiversity in Business YouTube channel, there's a great podcast from her recently. And this talks about the fact that organisations are waking up to the reality is that if you get this right for the neurodivergent employees or potential employees, you actually get this right for the whole of your workforce. So the where we'd love to get to is rather than having an annoying drop down box as you're getting onboarded to um, company systems, which says, number one, are you disabled? And then, you know, another drop down box, which disability and then dyslexia is in there or ADHD, which a lot of people correctly reject. What we'd love to get to is actually um, a philosophy which says, how do we as a business enable you to thrive rather than just survive? How do we enable you to come to work and actually deliver your best performance? What are the ways of working that suit you the best? And actually, I think there's been, obviously, the last two years have been fairly unique for us all in terms of COVID and, and working from home. But what what it, what this has really shown, there's been a seismic shift, I think, in businesses understanding that it isn't just about sitting at a desk um, from nine to 5.30 and presenteeism um, is largely an arcane term now. Um, what we increasingly understand is you give people flexibility and you give them the support to deliver in the way that they deliver best. And the whole business benefits. You know, we have better retention. We have better productivity. And, and this particularly applies to the neurodivergent employee in the firm who probably has historically felt under supported or underrepresented. And now I think that um, they're able to say, well, look, just as you allowed someone to do this because of their uh, a great example I heard last week is that one of my, my colleagues said that, you know, on a Friday at four o'clock, he had to go um, every week to pick up his daughter from school because she then goes to karate class. And it's a big kind of father daughter um bonding experience and and businesses accept that now you know it's not something that anyone raises an eye about because this chap in particular uh, you know works uh, in the evenings to make it up so just as we now accept that element we should also accept the fact that 
There are certain things that we need to do to enable our neurodivergent teammates to deliver their best performance. And the great news is, uh, Madeline, these accommodations tend to be not terribly expensive. They tend to be pretty minor. And the, the first thing that comes out is the fact that once we've made these accommodations, both the employee is more productive, the employee is more, more kind of energized and happy. But also, I think the business has learned a, a valuable lesson in that the art of the possible, it, the, these aren't terribly difficult problems to, to solve. And what would you advise about, so managers or, or people listening to this who want to do something to support, but maybe don't have huge policies in place in their organisations or lots of resources, where can they go to find out about how to support their employees? Well, we launched Neurodiversity in Business for this very reason, is that historically there hasn't been that kind of common voice around neurodiversity in, in, in the corporate world. Um, Organisations have seen, as, as I said earlier, that it sits in the too hard to deal with bucket. So just log on to our website, neurodiversityinbusiness.org, or follow us on our LinkedIn page, and you'll see in the months ahead the community that we've built and the, the best practice resources which will be available. That would be a really great starting point. What I would say is that also we have access to an amazing advisory board of community partners. So we are looking to make sure that organisations that contact us and individuals, etc., have access to the great and the good from across the uh, MD community. And you said that was for individuals as well. So would you, would neurodiversity in business be also somewhere where if you if you feel like you've got a neurodiverse profile, would you think that's somewhere you can go for support or is there better areas for that? Or uh, No, very much so. So we've, in, as part of our strategy for, for this year, we, we have a defined work stream around how do we actually support the potential employees who are struggling to get into the workforce because of, uh, recruitment practices which aren't necessarily suited to, to them and also the employees who are struggling to make meaningful change for example the ones who want to set up an employee resource group to catalyze change within their organization so whilst we when we launched in parliament we focused on the really big corporates that the household names we did that for a specific reason which is um, you know that has generated us enough publicity that we can also think about our longer term aim, which is that support for the neurodivergent employee, potential employee, but also the beating heart of a, an economy. And I think the UK falls within this. Isn't those global multinational organisations? It's the the, the medium size and the small enterprises. So whilst we're not able to um, kind of focus on everything at once, um, the, the strategy is being rolled out to make sure we're, we're, we're talking to, to those organisations as well. Finally, what do you see as the future for how organisations can enhance the inclusion of neuro minorities? Gosh, that's a, that's a really tricky question. I'm glad you left that to last. Um, so I think the future is one of uh, continual improvement, but probably not moving as quick as the neurodivergent employee or potential employee would like. Um, I think that organisations are, are waking up to the, the realisation that um, get this right for your neurodivergent teammates and employees, and actually you get this right for all of your employees. So the idea or the panacea is actually you stop considering neurodiversity as a a separate program or a separate kind of set of activities and it's just embedded into your BAU in, in, into your business as usual so that's where we're aiming for that the reality is is that this is a multi-year journey and no doubt in line with other social movements it's going to be a generational fight yes definitely seeeing this so in my work on gender and ethnicity that it's playing the long game is the key right well, I thank you very much, Dan. That's been really interesting and such an important, important kind of topic of conversation um, and something I think really important for our listeners. Um, for those of them who want to find out more about neurodiversity in business, we're going to provide a link accompanying the podcast. So, yeah, thank you and goodbye. Thanks so much. I enjoyed it. Thanks for listening to Connections. Subscribe for more insights into the issues shaping business, the economy and society.